listen to the vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I'm here, Mr. Greg Whiting, and uh, he's going to talk on anxiety, I'm assuming depression, all, all those things that are related to both life and business and how to become more successful. You have a, you have a special method you use, correct? Yeah, I've developed Prisma Method over the years, which is fusing trauma and neuroscience with somatic and mindfulness-based practices and energy medicine. Um, yeah, really helping people stop leading from a trauma response to kind of slow down and kind of, yeah, understand what is driving them. And if that drive is a whole lot of anxiety, depression, and trauma, how to heal that and come out the other side. Well, I have lots of people come on and talk about the subject, and I notice a lot of them, they try different things, and I, I've stressed before that not one specific method is a cookie-cutter thing for everyone, so I, I try to bring alternatives on, so you know, somebody might find your method more apt than to someone else, and uh I'm hoping maybe you can better explain your your method in in ways that we can handle, you know, tr uh, like for me, for instance, trauma. So um, I, I guess I'm gonna let you kind of get a little more in depth into it. Yeah, absolutely, and I 100% agree. There's no there's no direct path to healing, and there's no one right path to healing. I think so much of healing is actually the um, developing the right relationship. So it's actually not so much the modality. Uh, or the treatment, it's more the trust that you build with another human, you know, mm -hmm. is we're social creatures. So we're not meant to do life in isolation. And we're de certainly not meant to heal like the, the, the isolated patterns of alienation from trauma alone, right? That all yeah. happens in the relationship. So yeah, when folks are looking for, you know, healing support, they may, you know, search out a therapist or a healer, and it maybe isn't the right fit. And you know, don't give up there. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Um, and for me, I, I like to think of it as just kind of following some breadcrumbs along the way, you know, where maybe you read a book and that kind of sparks an idea. And then you kind of meet a person, have a conversation, and that kind of takes you in another direction. And so, you know, it could be a long and windy road, but, you know, I think when we're in the trenches of trauma, that can be a pretty hard road. Um, but I think once yeah. we've kind of excavated a, a deeper understanding of our pain, we start to kind of metabolize that pain. And then it points us more to purpose. So if we're like out of those trenches, we can kind of orient more to possibility. And I look mm -hmm. at, that's a lot of healing. It's reorienting the mind from pain to possibility. And, right. you know, that takes a lot of mind training. You know, the mind is a tricky place to get to know, especially when we have trauma on the brain. And so it's not a one and done. You know, there's no silver bullets um, as much as we live in a world of quick fixes. That's just not how this works. Um, it takes time. It takes time and commitment um, and devotion. Right. Um, but I think, you know, the more we start to kind of follow these breadcrumbs, the more we start to get a taste of a taste of ourselves and a new possibility in our lives. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've tried the uh, past life regression which is, uh, I admit, not a traditional type of method, but it seemed to have worked for me, uh, at least for the moment. I know, like you said, that's not a one and done thing. You need to, to stay at it. Uh, I went to therapy for years. I was on medication for years. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think the medication ended up hurting me more than helping. I have to stress this not everybody's the same it might work for you i'm just telling you my experience i'm not a doctor by any means um your method um is it more along line traditional or is this going to be a little outside like what i experienced with the uh the uh hypnotism and past life regression yeah good question um yeah i've not experienced either actually um but I have plenty of clients and colleagues that have explored, you know, those tools and have gotten great results. Uh, so again, I'm all for like, find what works and run with it. 
Um, I'm all about an integrative approach. That's why I've kind of pulled all these pieces. But you know, in terms of the energy medicine, because I think that's the 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 vehicle that really helps people heal in my body of work. You know, I like the idea that the body is a symphony orchestra. And so when we're experiencing health, there's a musicality of being, you know, all the different parts of us are in a harmonic resonance. So there's, there's just music and balance and harmony, you know, and then we experience stress, we experience trauma, the shorts, the nervous system gets short circuited. So all of a sudden there's like this breakdown in communication, you know, where the heart and the organs and the liver and the tissues and the cells where they are once all in balance and communicating with one another, all of a sudden they kind of have their backs turned and they forget that they're playing for the same team. They forget that they're part of the same symphony. So I look at energy medicine as going in to kind of clear out the noise, right? It's helping to clear out those distortions in the communication pathways that have broken down. And in restoring those communication pathways, the body's innate wisdom can kind of come back online. And that's when we're most in touch with our own capacity to heal. Um, you know, I like using the framework of innate wisdom, which was a term developed by in chiropractic. You know, so innate wisdom is this underlying healing mechanism that's guiding function. So if we get a paper cut, there's some intelligence that sends platelets and proteins and orchestrates all these biochemical transmissions to heal the paper cut. You know, same when we get a sprained ankle. You know, we're not thinking about that. That healing is just happening, right? right? But, you know, we, we're pretty adaptive, right? So we develop all these maladaptations to stress and trauma, and we seem to still be, you know, getting by in life okay until, you know, there's kind of, a forcing function where, you know, the one last thing stacks on the previous thing and then everything starts to fall apart. Yeah. Right. And yes. that's when, you know, and that's when our connection to that innate wisdom, you know, we've lost that connection. Right. Mm -hmm. But poor prior to that, you know, all of our symptoms is really our body's innate wisdom saying, Hey, pay attention to me. Listen, you know, something's, something's off over here. Right. It's kind of like the check engine light. Uh, right? Like our aches and our pains, but we're not really, we just haven't learned how to listen to that check engine light when it comes to our own bodies, right? Mm -hmm. If you really like to take care of your car, you'll usually call the mechanic or drive it right in, or unless you know how to get under your own hood. So, you know, healing and energy medicine is giving us tools to start to listen, look under the hood, and then see where those distortions are. So the whole body can start to kind of recover and heal itself. Wow. You, you hit on a lot there because, well, number one, my trauma started as a child. I uh, was molested when I was young and um, I kind of blocked it for years and it surfaced when I got older. A lot of stresses along the way, but I developed diabetes, high blood pressure, had a heart attack when I was 36. Um, I, I had a bad addiction problem, both alcohol and drugs, which thank God I don't anymore. Um, and I ended up because of my diabetes developing a, a, uh, it's a disease and it attacks the bone. So it breaks down. It's, uh, it's kind of an arthritic type thing, but it, it's literally deteriorating my bones. And so I haven't worked in a few years and arthritis is spreading, getting worse. Um, Maybe you, you have some answers for me that some these other doctors have not given me. You know, and well, first, I appreciate you sharing your journey um, and the connection between, you know, the imprints of trauma and your physical health makes sense to me. Um, I'd say I, I may have kind of a perspective that can bring some understanding, um, mm -hmm. not so much the answer. I, I think your body's wisdom has the answer, not me. Um, you know, but if we kind of, yeah, break that down, you know, an imprint of trauma and early development, um, you know, is signaling that we're not safe. Nobody's got our back um, or the people that are supposed to have our back don't. In fact, they may be the ones causing the harm. That's going to do a number on our body, our brain, and our nervous system. So then all of a sudden, our physiology, our biology, our whole structural 
you know, our posture is all going to start to become organized around guarding and protection and hypervigilance, right? right. So we're either going to default to that fight, flight, freeze, or appease, right? The, the hyper arousal are going to fight against the threat or run against, run from the threat. And if those aren't available options for us, then we're just going to freeze, right? Or try to make everything better while thinking, especially in early development, when something's when something's really gone awry in the environment, in early development, that's all we know. So we normalize it. We think, well, that's just how it is. But we know on a deeper level that something's not right. But we internalize that. And so then we make that about us. Well, something's bad's happening. It must be my fault, right? So then we have all these identity structures that are organized around these imprints of trauma. And the imprints of trauma leave residue within our physical body. So, you know, our conscious mind is what we think we believe. And that's just like the tip of the iceberg, you know, but what we really believe the subconscious and unconscious mind, that's all stored in the body. Right. And, you know, I look at cardiovascular disease and I look at addiction as both, you know, symptoms of isolation and alienation, which again, that's, that's trauma, right? Um, you know, we can experience adverse ex adverse events in our life, but if we have support, it doesn't imprint as trauma because we have people that have our back. So we can go through something really tough, but make sense of it and kind of brush it off and kind of keep moving forward. Um, but if nobody's got our back, that that's not the case, right? So that starts to calcify and kind of create this rigid you know, makeup of our entire, all of our cells and our tissues, our musculoskeletal system. So I, I share that to kind of normalize how these imprints of trauma start to then, you know, present themselves in disease and illness. And yeah, I, I find that, you know, one of the tools I work with is body talk, which is a, a, a healthcare system that's working with neuromuscular biofeedback and it's getting precise information as to how do we determine where the nervous system is short-circuited in a very personalized, individualized manner to then help the system kind of reboot blood, nerve, and lymph supply to the cells and the tissues. And how to, you know, this stagnation of emotion compromises the immune system, right? So that's going to, you know, just have this ripple effect on all aspects of our health. Um, and so again, as we start to repair these broke down patterns of communication, which have us feeling really fragmented and split, it just helps us reorient to feeling more whole and more integrated within ourselves. And the more we experience our wholeness, the more our, that innate wisdom comes online. And then, you know, blood sugar levels can balance, you know, again, every, the body's a metaphor too. So like blood sugar stuff right? Well, life maybe has been pretty bitter, right? So then we start to find ways to kind of derive a sense of sweetness. And that may be through what we're drinking, what we're eating, and that may have some adverse effects on our health. But as we start to derive more sweetness in our life, you know, because we've derived a sense of safety and belonging, and we develop a support system. So we're no longer organized around the pain, the trauma, the isolation, then you know, our blood sugar level balances, right? And then that has a cascading effect on our beliefs and our behaviors, you know, and our hormones. And that's, you know, our physiology starts to shift, our behavior starts to shift. So all of these pieces are completely related, right? But often they're being treated as very separate, right? As if yes. they're not part of the whole. Yes. I think doctors, all the doctors need to come together uh, I'm talking your your primary doctor. I'm talking if you're going to a therapist and you've got a psychologist, I think all of them need to come together and talk about everything because I found some of the, the drugs interacting with each other. Like I, I go to a, a, a pain specialist and I have told them I don't want to have anything to do with opioids because I am an addictive type person. And I know that would lead to something bad. I just got off a bunch of drugs and I don't need to get on anything else. And the it's funny because the doctor that I'm seeing now, 
he gave me a medication that's actually for you to get off of opioids, but it off label it's for pain as well. But I think it's interacting with some of the other medications that I'm taking because I, I'm tell you what, I, my whole body, my mindset, everything has been so topsy turvy since I don't know what else to do anymore. Yeah. I mean, it, it takes a while for the body to recalibrate to different inputs like medication. Um, and, you know, I have a, a psychiatrist that refers patients to me and he first came to know about my work because all of a sudden one of his patients who was also my client just wasn't responding to the medication anymore. And he realized she no longer needed the medication. Um, I don't, I have no say, and I, I, you know, I, my work is non-prescriptive, non-diagnostic. I just help people reclaim their own capacity to heal, but working in tandem with him, you know, he was able to see, wow, like she's in a different place. She doesn't need the same treatment. Um, you know, I look at, you know, sometimes we're going to need intervention like medicine or, you know, certain yeah. procedures. So everything has its place and its value, but I find that when we develop a healing practice, you know, and I say this in the most loving way, but my work is really to help people feel their pain. And, you know, again, in early development, when we have this imprint of trauma and we don't have support, it's too overwhelming, right? We don't have the capacity to feel that pain. So just like you shared, we kind of shut that down. We often erase it from our conscious mind. And that's a survival strategy, right? Mm -hmm. um, so even if we may not be replaying it in our mind, it's replaying itself in our heart and in our cells yes. and our tissues. And that's going to have a way of catching up to us. And so sometimes we're going to depend on medication because that pain is still too great for us to make sense of. And so healing is developing a container where we start to have that support, where someone has our back. And we start to have a roadmap to kind of understand how this pain has been imprinted upon us and how that has organized parts of our identity and our beliefs about ourselves and about the world and how then we've kind of postured ourselves around those beliefs often to protect ourselves and starting to kind of negotiate, oh, do the, are those behaviors necessary the way they once were? Um, and that can feel pretty threatening to start to let go of some of that guarding and protection. But over time, the repair experience is, oh, now I'm in a different type of relationship or a different type of home environment or a different type of work environment. And I, I don't have to, you know, walk on pins and needles or walk on eggshells. You know, it's like I'm, everything's actually OK. And slowly we start to have a repair experience where we can start to let go of some of that guarding. Um, and over time, yeah, so much of my work, I mean, my own journey, I came to this work because of my own chronic pain, anxiety, and depression, severe curve in my spine. Um, you know, I don't carry any of that chronic pain anymore. I'm three inches taller today than I once was. Um, that didn't happen overnight, right? And that's not an easy path. That was a lot of hard work. Um, you know, healing's not for the faint of heart. You know, medication's going to suppress pain. And sometimes that's that's exactly what we need. And over time, if we develop the tools and the capacity and the resources, we develop more bandwidth to start to m metabolize some of the pain, process some of the pain. And then, you know, I look at healing instead of suppressing the pain, it's helping the body express it to move it through. So we're no longer holding on to it. Um, and when we're no longer holding on to pain, life can really open up in, in profound ways. So walk me through it. How, how would I start to do something like that? Yeah. So, you know, I share energy medicine as a hands-on healing practice. So right. you know, um, I find, because a lot of, especially if some of the, if some of these trauma patterns have been imprinted in early development, we don't have words for that pain. Some of this was like pre-verbal um, we can't make sense of it in our mind, right? And so that's a lot of the clients and students that are drawn to my work have actually been to lots of therapy and they've tried to like talk their way through it, think their way through it. 
Um, yeah. And that's maybe helped them make a little sense of their pain intellectually, but it hasn't relieved their body of that pain. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, I mentioned body talk, which is one of the healthcare systems I practice. For me, my second body talk session, she was balancing some hormones to some beliefs to some emotions. And then my spine started to unravel, right? And so I got off the table in that session and was, you know, a half inch taller. And I was like, wow, that's pretty outrageous. And, you know, I, I was, you know, I was hooked, you know, for the four years that I was working with that practitioner, you know, I was just working intensely with her, you know, probably weekly by weekly having sessions. And again, just restoring internal communication, right? Helping my nervous system reset in relationship to the body. Um, and Reiki is the hands-on healing practice that really right. is helping us just make loving contact with ourselves. Because I find, you know, I was having this conversation with a client the last week, actually, so much of their life, they've been fighting against this pain as if it's like a, a monster living inside of them, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I could relate, you know, when I was suffering with that, you know, three inch curve in my spine and, and you know, excruciating chronic pain, I was hating it. But really, I was just hating myself. And so the Reiki practice helped me start to realize that what I'm fighting against is just this wounded part of myself from early childhood that didn't have the right support, you know, that got beat up. Um, but here I was continuing to beat up on that same part of myself. So the Reiki practice is, is really helping make loving contact with ourself. Um, and in that, you know, it starts to neutralize, it starts to neutralize the energetic and emotional charge and how that has a grip on our body, on our physiology, mm -hmm. right? So how all of that guarding and protecting kind of gnarled up my spine. It's like, once I started to have these shifts in awareness, I no longer needed the same guarding and protection that I once needed. Well, then my body was no longer holding the in the same pattern that it once did. So you know, I'm kind of sharing how the, I, I'm kind of trying to intellectualize a process that's beyond intellect, you know, when certain things shift energetically, you're kind of like, oh, I'm no longer carrying, you know, the weight of the world on my shoulders. But right. it's like, it's not that I consciously put the weight of the world of the shoulders down. It's just that my body's innate wisdom came online in such a way that my body let that the weight of the world down. So it's like, I didn't do it, but my body's wisdom did, you know, the same wisdom that healed that paper cut, let go of all that gnarled up energy. And once you get a taste of that, you start to trust it. And the more you trust it, it starts to gain momentum and speed. And then you can start to lean into the healing instead of fighting against the wound. And so I have a daughter who has abilities and she's able to like this transfer energy uh, to heal. And although she's tried on me, I don't know, it, it maybe it's something internally that I'm blocking it or whatever. Is this comparable to that? Is it mean, same thing? We're talking like crystal healing, that kind of methods, or is this something totally different? Um, don't get me wrong. I love, I love some crystals. I don't work with crystals in my healing practice per se. Um, and I think there are people who are adept and skilled at just, yeah, transferring energy. What I like about Reiki is that Reiki is defined as universal life force energy. And so in that sense, we're tapping into something greater than us. So I'm never pouring my energy into my clients. I'm not depleting my own reserves as I'm sharing, you know, healing energy with others. In fact, you know, I'm getting charged up just as much as I'm, you know, seeing my clients get charged up. So we're just, we're just connecting to that universal current of energy that's present in all things, right? So it's just right. a remembrance of that connection. Again, because these imprints of trauma are the lie of trauma is that we're separate and that we're alone and then no one has our back. And, you know, the truth is we are connected. And yep. so it just helps us live in the awareness of that connection. 
um, and not just mentally and emotionally, but physically, right? And then our physiology, our biology all starts to sh- uh, to shift and change. So I'm going to ask you, and this is my belief, and I'm not sure if you believe the same way, but I believe that there is a, a center universal um, like consciousness, energy, the whole thing. It, it's all, all, everything's connected. And that's my belief. What God is, is that, that whole connect, like, well, I, I don't know what other way to put it, but that connecting energy and that oneness of everything. Is that, is that what you believe? Yeah. I, well, and I play, I play with words here where with my practice, you know, my practice helps me have an experience of that. And I let my experience guide me. So it's more experience guiding me than belief. Um, And I know I'm playing with words when I say that, but I'll just share like, you know, in Chinese medicine, they speak of the Shen, which is the light that shines through the eyes. And the understanding is that there's only one light and that one light is shining through all of our eyes, right? And you can see sometimes when we, you know, pass someone with depression or when I had depression, you know, it's like we start to have a film over our eyes. Like some of our eyes are more dim and less bright. It's like, so we've lost connection to that Shen, that spirit. So that's, that's my experience in healing is, yeah, we are all connected to the Shen. Um, And so sure. Do I believe that? Yes. But I I also, when I teach, I I want people to have their own experience. So Mm -hmm. I don't want any, I don't want the practice to become dependent upon belief. Um, And yet I also share, yeah, I like to kind of break down also kind of, you know, the idea of the absolute, you know, and with Reiki, what if there's a positive and a negative charge and where that balance is, is the absolute, you know, this neutral field of energy where all information in the universe is present, right? So we're tapping into that. So I try to like, bring in kind of a lens from like the quantum world but yeah that that absolute can also be likened to god right and then reiki itself is a spiritual practice you know universal life force energy or Mm -hmm. spirit so but i want people to have just a taste of that and experience of it without belief because that is accessible um and i think often our beliefs can limit our capacity to connect with that essence um, and I think that's the heart of healing is just connecting to that essence. Well, and, and I was trying to get a better understanding of what, what you do. And I get that makes sense. Uh, I mean, to me, there has to be some kind of belief in order for anything to work. You know, there's, I don't know um, if it's just a matter of believing that this energy is coming to you. I mean, there's some kind of belief involved, right? Yes and no. I, I think there's going to be plenty of people that don't believe in energy medicine or Reiki, and they will never seek it out because they don't believe in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I I spend no time or energy trying to <clears throat> make believers, <laughs> um, but I have had some skeptics show up. Um, you know, I had a husband who of a wife that I was treating and um, you know, her, her neck pain and her anxiety went away and he was struggling with pain. So she was encouraging him to come and he finally came, but begrudgingly, and you know, told me straight to my face. I think this is bullshit, but Hey, you know, my wife told me to come. So I'm here, you know, he became one of my most devoted clients. So he arrived, thought it was bullshit, didn't believe in it, but he had an experience, right? And when you have an experience and something moves you, you know, when you have a a new experience of yourself, of your health, of your wellness, a shift in perspective. um, Yeah. Either that makes a believer of you or, you know, you just let your own lived experience be your guide. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could believe the sky is red. It doesn't make it true. Right. Um, But I do believe there is value in belief, right? A lot of this work is interrogating, you know, the the limitation of belief and the sabotage of belief and, you know, rewriting those narratives. Because, yeah, if we believe one thing is true, that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do believe in the power of belief. And yet I think some of this work can kind of 
belief can be suspended and, you know, we can kind of sneak this work in even despite a disbelief. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I find that real close to spirituality because I used to, to, I used to preach, I used to go to church, the whole nine yards. And then religion for me, it, I just got turned off to it. Let's put it that way. I, I would go to a different church and this place would have this indoctrination going on and then go to another one. You got another belief going on here and that spirituality is I, you know, I, I believe in God, of course, but I don't believe in all those rules that it seems like man makes up, but I don't try to indoctrinate people into saying, Oh, you got to become a Christian or you're, you know, you're going to go to hell, that kind of thing. No, I, I bring a sense of spirituality of, you know, there's, you can be lifted to a, a higher uh, resonance, I guess, in the universe. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe it. I mean, you're, you're, you're getting to a higher level and without pounding some kind of dogma in somebody's head. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Um, and that's, uh, you know, and that's for me, what if I have an experience of God without a belief in God? And that's, 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 the, that's the realm I like to explore. And, and, but I want, when I share these practices, I want to make healing and a spiritual practice as accessible and relevant to, to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking years ago when I was teaching in person, I had two people in the same training and for one of them, it helped them reconnect to their church and their religion. And for another, it helped them walk away from the church, but they were both deepening into their spiritual practice. One was in alignment with their religious practice and one wasn't. And that was, you know, yep. two people in the same room who, you know, respected each other. And um, so, yeah, I, I just like to make this work accessible. And mm -hmm. so I, I think it's not dependent upon belief, although a lack of belief might not, might get in the way of you taking a step in, in, in through the door. Mm -hmm. And I have to make this clear too. I'm not putting anybody down. If you believe in your religion and that's what's get you through the day, you go for it. It's just, that wasn't working for me. So oh. yeah, just want to make that clear. I don't want anybody yeah. mad at me thinking I'm putting down their religion. Uh, but there's so many out there. Good night. But um, so you can do this. Well, like over Zoom calls too, or is this going to have to be a one on one in the same room kind of thing? Yeah, all my work, both one on one and in my group, is all online, either over the phone or, yeah, in my group container, we have Zoom sessions. Um, I, I do some in person events uh, at times, you know, before COVID, I did more in person stuff, but now my whole platform you know, the foundational teachings, you know, my online course, there's a trauma and neuroscience roadmap. The seven pillars of my system are kind of the drop pins on that roadmap. So that's kind of like helping people map this journey from pain to purpose. Mm -hmm. And so all that's through an eight week course that has audio recordings and then workbooks. So people can kind of, yeah, literally map out just this healing path and better orient. So they're not blindfolded as they're kind of exploring this journey. And then I have somatic and mindfulness-based practices that we have three uh, sessions a month where I'm guiding, you know, students through these practices that they're learning in the course, but getting support with me guiding them. So, you know, again, the mind can be a tricky thing. So it's, it's nice to have support. So as we're learning how to sit with, you know, ourselves and to sit with what historically has been overwhelming, we start to create some distance and reorient to you know, those imprints of pain and yeah, have a, a, a different vantage point. And that's, you know, a lot of my work too, is kind of understanding that what if our personal soul and the universal soul are one and the same. So again, feeling a connection to that, which is universal. So we kind of get out of the, the personal, personal story of our lives that, keeps us really narrowly focused and we can like broaden our view. Yeah. And then the energy medicine piece, the Reiki one foundation training is a monthly workshop um, that, yeah, we get together. We yeah do lots of hands-on healing work, even over zoom. 
And yeah, where we're, people have a chance to be held and supported in community, get lots of feedback, you know, do partner shares, some, some group work. Uh, and then we have a Slack community so people can ask questions and just share their experience, get direct feedback. So it's kind of a at your own pace, uh, at your, you know, have your own, choose your own journey kind of um, practice. So I interviewed a lady that it's something she said really resonated with me where she said, you know, you need to relive the, the trauma, but every time that you you do and you tell the story, you change the story, the narrative of it, where you basically you become the hero of the story and that you've pretty much stopped the event from happening, even though you know it hasn't, but you've kind of convinced yourself. Is that kind of involved as well? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, again, to each their own. <clears throat> right, right. Um, what I like about working with energy medicine is it's often helping to dissolve the imprints and the residue of trauma that are stored in the subconscious and unconscious without us having to regurgitate it or think it through. So, you know, I'm thinking of a client who, you know, had a lot of trauma with a family member that we didn't spend, aside from our initial phone call, where she was kind of telling me, you know, where she's at, you know, in our work together, we never discussed that relationship. So we didn't focus on the trauma. Again, we're focusing on just restoring the innate wisdom. And when we right. restore our connection to the innate wisdom, it puts these imprints of trauma in perspective. So instead of them taking center stage, they kind of just are in one seat in the theater, right? Instead that was kind of a long line of what I was trying to get at, but I didn't say it right. But, you know, but I do think, so I think sometimes working energetically, it helps to dissolve the charge and we don't have to relive it and regurgitate it, think it out, talk it out. But I do agree that sometimes there is power in that. Um, and so sometimes speaking the unspeakable, right? Because sometimes we have such traumatic experience, we can't put words to it. You know, the parts of our, you know, developmental trauma that we froze, we shut down, right? That we blacked out. And as we start to make sense of it, there can be a reclaiming of power in naming it, right? So when we can name the victimization, it can help us no longer be the victim. So I, I do feel like there's power in that. And I don't think it's always necessary. Um, and, and so, yeah, again, everyone's journey is different. And, you know, and I think we reclaim parts of our humanity in varying degrees. So we may reclaim part of our humanity at one point where, you know, speaking that is very important. And then years later, it, it may not be relevant or necessary at all, right? We may not be carrying that story at all, but mm -hmm. at one point owning that story may have been a very critical, you know, stake in the ground, if you will. So at any point in your journey to your own personal healing, did you ever once have any doubt about this at all? I mean, healing is a long and windy road. It's often, <laughs> sure. it's often sitting in the center of the cyclone. And so, you know, it's the chaos that with the right tools and support lend itself to new order and new intelligence. But that's even with all the right support, all the right tools, that can be a very gnarly journey. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so absolutely. Is there doubt along the way? Yes. And, you know, each time I come out the other side of that doubt, it can become kind of a, a stepping stone to more trust, right? And right. again, that's where we then gain more momentum. So, you know, as we go through another blip in the road and life throws more curveballs at us, you know, it's, it's, Oh, I, I took that leap of faith before. I trusted in the uncertainty before. So now I have more data points to to let me know it'll be okay to lean into the uncertainty here and trust that, you know, there's there's a safe landing on the other side. Well, the only reason I bring that up is because there's no doubt somebody out there that's going to be watching this or listening to this, and they've tried so many different things and they 
they're just stuck in the same old, same old, and they're going to be like, oh, well, this is just going to be something else that I'm going to try, and it's just not going to work. But I, I can't st- not say try everything before you give up. You know what I mean? Try everything out there. So what kind of encouraging words could you give to somebody out there with that doubt in their mind? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people find me when they're at the end of their rope. Um, perfect example, someone who could not get out of bed for two years, you know, their trauma turned into fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. Um, they were a hundred thousand dollars in medical debt. They had seen over 200 doctors. Um, but all of those approaches to healing were treating from the top down. Well, let's treat this thing that looks off. We did this lab work, so let's treat those numbers. And so it was everybody coming at them from the outside in where, you know, my orientation to healing is, no, let's actually ask the body what it needs instead of telling it. And when you ask the body what it needs, it it actually has a lot of wisdom and insight and will guide you there. Um, and yeah, it may take you a while to find the right person with the right tools to 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 hold your hand through that journey. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, I think we you could try to give up for a moment, throw your hands up in the air, and I don't know, just listen. There's probably going to be another like current of energy that says no, nope, I got to keep going, right? right. And I say, you know, I think healing can be fits and starts. Where yeah, I've probably given up many times along the way. And then I'm like, no, like, that's not an option. Like, I thought it was an option, right? I've lost hope, but no, like, then there's another impulse that, you know, invites me to take action. And so, you know, and again, for each person, what are those breadcrumbs? For me, first, it was like reading some books on meditation, and it was time in nature. And then it was live music and just tapping into music became a really healing force for me. And then that's what introduced me to Reiki, which I was never looking for Reiki or a spiritual practice, you know, without that happened by happenstance. But then I found something I didn't even know I was looking for. And then I followed that current. Um, but yeah, healing is not a linear path. Exactly. And it's not for the faint at heart, but it's like, what's the other option? Are we just going to sit in our pain or are we going to find someone to to hold our, you know, to to, to have our back along alongside us um having that support alongside us you know i think is a much better option man my body's telling me i need a milkshake a cheeseburger and some fries <laughs> <laughs> no but seriously I, i've i have tried so many different things and i get a little bit of something from everybody that i interview honestly and I, I I never give up. I just I know there's somebody out there that's at that point where they're just ready to say I, I'm done. They throw their hands up. I encourage you, please, please, please don't give up. There's an answer out there. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing, because somebody here is going to resonate with you. And I hopefully um, if you haven't tried it, you can get a hold of Greg. And Greg, you have a website, correct? Yeah, prismamethod.com will take people to the online course and community, gregwhiting.com, if you want to learn more about both the course or my one-on-one work, and that's W-I-E-T-I-N-G. Um, and, I'm, and I'm on Instagram, greg underscore whiting. So um, yeah, follow me online, reach out, schedule a call. It starts with a conversation, right? Yeah. Um, and that, that connection. And if, if I'm not the right fit, I'm, I I want, I want people to get better. Um, and so if I'm not the right fit, then I'm going to let folks know where else to go. And, um, you know, and again, it's, it's a bit of a trial and error. And, and even now, like, you know, I might be working with one teacher or mentor or healer and, you know, sometimes we meet the end of that road, that arc of transformation is over. And then it's time to, you know, find a new teacher uh, or a new methodology, right? Because as we evolve and grow, our needs evolve and grow. um, And then we want to find different ways to support us. Oh yeah, And you always know when somebody cares, when they're willing to, to help you find someone else, if you're not the one that's able to help, you know, quick story, went to a store and they actually told me, 
where to get the same item for a better price at a different store. And I thought, why would you do that? You know, they were so nice. I just went ahead and bought it there anyway, even though I would have saved money at the other place because they were honest about it. So I think if you're willing to be honest about your practice and, you know, passing them on to someone else that might be more compatible, that that's pretty cool, man. It really is. Well, I want to create win-wins. You know, I wake up each day and, you know, I work with clients over, you know, a, lo a long period of time. So I, I don't want, I don't want someone on my schedule that I don't think I can help because <laughs> that's going to make both of us feel pretty shitty. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and so it's all about a resonance. I, and not only do I want to be able to help that person, but I want to make sure that we can have a good time doing it. Right. I mean, unearthing trauma is, is no easy task, but I like to bring a lot of levity and lightness and playfulness to it. And so, you know, finding, you know, the full spectrum of our, our humanity, you know, the more we have access to our, our sorrow, the more we have access to our joy. Yeah. Um, and if I'm not the right fit, then I st still want you to get better. And I'm just going to invite you to, you know, find the better fit. So you, so you get what you want. Thank you, Greg. I really, really appreciate your time and coming on my show. I, I hope you, you can help someone out there that's watching or listening to this right now. And I will put the links to your to your site and to your social media in the description. So people can just click on it and go to it. I know it's a lot more convenient for folks. Um, stay in touch, man. Um, let me know how things are going and maybe uh, we have another show in the future. That sounds great, Kyle. I appreciate it. And I also want to thank all of you out there. If you are new to the channel, I really appreciate you stopping by and I hope you'll hit that subscribe button. Come on back. For those of you who are regular, it's because of you that I get to do this and that I get people like Greg on here and uh, your support means everything in the world to me. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and Peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.